Thank you, Pastor George. Thank you, thank you. Let's uh, pray together this evening, and, and as we pray, uh, remember, I have two uh, prayer needs I just want to share with you. One of them you already know about, uh, Josh Jones. We've been praying for him. I went in for surgery in Little Rock on Friday, uh, had a tendon reattached in his arm and a, and a major artery uh, that was reattached. Uh, just a, a, a kid accident, hit his arm while playing with some other children on a street sign and severed it down to the artery and had to go into the hospital and have surgery here and then he was taken to Little Rock, had surgery Friday. He's now back home doing well, but it will be several uh, months of recuperation uh, to get his arm back to working and praying that the nerves will all be attached correctly and he'll have full use of that arm. And so let's remember little Josh. Josh is, boy, how old is Josh? Is he second, seven years old? Seven years old? I think a second grader. I think so. And then also Jeff Shepard uh, was in emergency room today. Uh, he's had uh, migraine headaches for the last several days uh, to the point of nausea and just can't, can't even function. And so was at the, at the doctor. They don't know if it's a bacterial thing or not, but they did the CAT scan and saw that there wasn't any, anything wrong there. But uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, I feel for people that have migraines. And some of you have had those, a number of you have had. And, and we've had people in our church that have suffered them terribly. Um, I've been fortunate I haven't had those. I don't, I don't want to know that pain. But I'm told that it is terrible. And so just praying for Jeff, he, he suffers from these ever so often. And, and I have no doubt, I think of the many uh, men and women that work in very stressful jobs, very stressful situations. And I have no doubt that that doesn't, doesn't help that issue. But let's remember Jeff as well. Are there some other key prayer needs, Alan? Mike and Chen Melamut were part of our church, had a little boy named Xavier, and then had, a, had another baby, I believe, right after they, they moved, uh, moved to Arizona, and back in Minnesota now. Uh, but uh, just a sweet, sweet family, young family, or early 30s, late 20s, early 30s, and, and he's had a major throat cancer surgery, and now this progressive cancer in his, in his lymph nodes, and two precious little babies. What a one-year-old and Xavier is maybe four, four years old now or something. And so how difficult that is. Any others? Okay. Cheryl uh, is Mary, Mary Beeler's niece and uh, Fred Willard and, and Harriet Mendenhall's niece. And, and we just buried her mother, uh, Dee Barry, uh, their sister, uh, just, you know, several months ago. And, and she's on her deathbed. And so pray, pray for her and her family. Let's pray. Father, we, tonight, we know that there's trials and there's difficulties and there's challenges of life. But we also know you are good and you are mighty. And we celebrate your love and your grace. And we lift up these requests that we've mentioned tonight. Your word tells us to bring our knees before one another, uh, praying for healing and wholeness, confessing our sins. And, and Lord, we bring that need to you tonight. We lift up Josh Jones, this precious little boy, with Steve and Amber's parents and his young sister. And Lord, would you touch him and continue to bring wholeness and healing to him Terry and Laura Sullivan's grandson. Lord, a precious guy he is. Bring healing and wholeness to his arm. Father, we lift up Jeff Shepard to you tonight in the, in the 
migraine headaches that he has been suffering. We pray for your healing touch upon him. And even now to give him relief and wholeness and health and blessing. And right now we just covenant for your healing touch upon him. We lift up Mike Melema to you. This young man who's been a part of our church. Who, who loves you and loves his family. And has been suffering so much this past year. With these bouts and these surgeries, these cancer he's been fighting, and now with this aggressive cancer that he's dealing with. Lord, we pray. We just covenant together. You're healing your whole touch upon him, the deliverer, to bring about wholeness in his cells and his body to fight off this rogue disease and bring about wholeness. Lord, be with Chan and strengthen her and those precious children, Lord, to lift them up keep them in your care. Help the family. and Bless them, Lord, we pray. And we lift up Cheryl to you, the family, tonight as she's struggling literally with breath and, and with uh, the last ounces of life that she has. Lord, it won't be long as she'll be in your presence and how we pray for your comfort and your grace upon the family, your peace upon the kids that are suffering and struggling right now, just the hurt and the brokenness of seeing the grandmother die and now a mother suffer and Lord how we pray that things could be turned around and wholeness could come about in her life and a miracle would happen there Lord would you just make a way for her for the family and in your peace and time Lord once again we seek your face tonight and we pray these things in Jesus name amen and amen when we Read the book of Acts as we've been going through it on Sunday mornings and looking at these first 10 chapters and talking about how God works in the life of the church. There's a reoccurring theme that we find over and over and over that comes about in the passages that we, we read in Acts as well as we find it in the Gospels. We find it in Paul's letters. It's, it's a theme of, of trials and tribulations. You know, even in the prayer request we share tonight, um, we know that people are persecuted for their faith. We know that uh, people suffer all kinds of difficulties. Uh, we know that uh, persecution in our own country is pretty tame uh, when we think of trials and tribulations. And, and yet, if you go, uh, you go on, on the web and you look at uh, a place called Open Doors Ministries, they say that that every, every month, 322 Christians are put to death in the world. Every month, every, every month, more than 210 churches and properties are destroyed. Every month, over 770 acts of violence are committed against believers. Trials and tribulations, persecutions. And you know, whether big or small, uh, things don't always go uh, the way we want them to go, do we? We all experience difficulties and trials, sometimes even on a daily, day ba daily basis. And, and what I want to do tonight is just take a few moments and look at that, that word according to Scripture and, and see what God would say to us about dealing with the trials and the tribulations that, that come our way. Uh, we use the word trial in a lot of different circumstances. We, we think of life-threatening medical issues. We think of what Jeff is going through, what, what the Joneses are going through with Josh's arm. We think of stressful issues or financial issues or some aggravating uh, scenario that would uh, cause us to despair or, or be uh, upset. Trials happen. But, but what do we mean when we use the word trial? I think in, in a Christian way, you could say that it's kind of our own language. It's Christianese for what believers might term uh, what an unbeliever might call a bummer or a bad day or uh, a difficulty or a hardship. But when we say trial, we mean, we mean something bad, a bad thing, but it implies more than just a bummer or, or a difficulty or a... a a hardship that we experienced, it, it implies that there's a purpose behind it. That as believers, when we experience trials or tribulations, it isn't just karma or, or fate. It's, there's something behind it because we believe that God is sovereign. 
we believe God is at work and that we're not left alone in this world. And, and the truth is we all need to be reminded that God's in control. God is at work in our world and in our life. And even when it seems like things are happening around us, we think of Mike and Chin and we go, how crazy or how senseless. We think of all that even Paul has gone through and others in our congregation and how difficult those times are. And yet, to remind ourselves and be reminded that God is still with us. The word trial is defined as the act of trying, a, a testing, a putting to proof. It's you're going to prove something to be, to be true. And, and we use it in a courtroom setting where somebody's trying to prove their case, trying to prove the truth. And in an athletic event, they have trials to, to see, if, uh, see if a person who can do what they're supposed to do can make the grade. They, they'll be eliminated if they don't make the trials, that they prove that they have a skill. Uh, we use it maybe in baking, a recipe. We, we have trials to get that perfect pie crust. But in all of the examples, we see that the purpose of the trials is a trying. It's, it's trying to bring something to perfection, to be the best or to be true. And what's actually happening to us, you think in a spiritual sense, in, in our faith, in, in, in our character, that in a real sense, what we understand trials to be is a, is a testing, a, a trying, a, a transformation that would ultimately shape us and make us more like Christ. A refiner's fire, we might call it. A, a trying time. Now, it's not easy to get real excited over that, is it? Say, wow, I'm going through a trial. I'm going through a difficulty. I'm going to be more like Jesus. Whoopee, bring it on, you know. We typically don't pray that way. We say, Lord, that when the trials come, help me to stay strong. Or, you know, if I have to suffer through this, Lord, help me to, to make it through in the spirit of Christ. But it's sometimes not the greatest thing to be chosen by God to experience a trial. It hurts. Uh, we have pain. We have pressure. It's the squeezing and cutting and the, and the pruning and the hacking and the tear away, tearing away of our imperfections. And because... The truth is our, our nature, our sinful nature is hard. It's embarrassing. It's, it's evil, even painful. That our patience is tested and our faith is tested. What, what really is true and what's really going to last? Our character is tested. And, and, you know, not to be facetious, but the truth is it is an honor, according to Scripture, to suffer for the Lord because in our trials and in our tribulations we are transformed and yet it doesn't make it really any easier it's still difficult it's still painful if we're honest it's still stressful and and sometimes if we're just honest suffering stinks it's just not good but the truth the scripture tries to get us to understand is God has a purpose for our trials there are two Bible verses I want to just take a few moments and look at tonight uh, that that kind of help us when we ask the question, what does, what does an omnipotent God, a God that knows everything, a God that sees everything, a God that, that is powerful above all, why does he permit bad things to happen to good people? Why do we experience these difficult things? The first one's out of James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2, and the other one's out of 1 Peter chapter 1, if you want to look over there at those two verses. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. I mean, right up front he says it, doesn't he? Consider it pure joy. Pure joy. I'm trying to put my hand around that, my arms around, my mind around, pure joy. Unadulterated, un undiluted, pure joy my brothers and my sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know we can consider it joy because we know that the testing of our faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. James is saying that when trials and, and tribulations come that really it's for our own 
benefit. It's to test our faith, to remind us that God is in control, that he loves us, that he's at work, that, that he'll use what's happened to us for our best, that he's going to bring us to maturity. And by faith, we acknowledge that ultimately God is working for the good of those that love him, to those that are called according to his purpose, and he'll use it for his glory. Peter goes on in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says it a little bit different way, and yet it's kind of the same kind of concept. And starting in verse 6, chapter 1 of 1 Peter, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So our faith, worth more than gold, and gold is, when fire comes, even gold is melted, even gold is, it dissipates, even gold is burned up, but he says faith is even more precious than that. Even the fire can't destroy it. It's going to be proven genuine and result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Both are talking about joys and trials. They're talking about the positive aspect or, or the benefit of them. Now, I think for, for new believers, you know, you think about here in the book of Acts, as we've been going through Acts together, they weren't just running out of coffee and uh, you know, at the office or maybe run out of gas on their way home. They, they weren't just dealing with, with uh, overdrafting a checking account and these were the type of trials they were going through. Their trials were even more severe. They were losing homes and families and, and even their own lives. Uh, when Peter penned these words, uh, Christians were being put to death at the hands of persecutors. When you look at early church history and you see what... Uh, Caligula and, and, and Domitian and, and Nero and other emperors did, uh, Roman emperors, how they just persecuted and, and literally sought to exterminate Christians. They had no rights. They had no position. They had no ability to protect themselves. And here he's going, consider it pure joy when, when difficulties come about, when you get to suffer for the Lord. They experienced severe persecution, even to the point of death. You look back at, at, uh, at Stephen being stoned. It, it's kind of, um, today we don't see exactly like that, but we do see uh, Islamic terrorists beheading Christians. Now, they may not say it on the news. They may say another group of people were beheaded, but, but when you find the truth out, you discover the people in the Middle East or in Africa are uh, there and in those nations, they're, they're believers, they're Christians, and the Islamic uh, state has come in and said, you repent or you die, and they die. They're martyred. We don't see that necessarily in our country, do we? I mean, we don't, but we have had cases in the court systems of believers who have said, out of my religious beliefs, we're not going to serve, I'm not going to make a, a wedding cake you know, for a homosexual marriage or something like that, and they've been forced out of business. They've been bankrupt. Uh, they've been chastised. They've received death threats. And, uh, we've had communities where a certain type of behavior was sought to be made normal that in the past was abnormal, and, and for those people to stand up against that and say, no, that's not what we believe. That's not the way it ought to be. Then they're put down and chastised and ridiculed and even threatened. And yet, he goes on and says, uh, there's something that's happening here that's even beyond what we see on the surface, that God is working out something here. And I wonder, you know, if we don't say, and we've heard it say, you know, why is it that God allows this to happen? Why is it that some people suffer? And boy, this is a big question, and we're not going to be able to deal with it all tonight. We could take a long time dealing with it. And the truth is, I don't think I have the answers all to deal with it. And yet there are some answers that help give us direction and give us help and, and hope. When we look at this whole question of pain and, and suffering, 
the answers aren't easy, but there are, there are answers. You know, we could put God on trial and we could say, okay, God, we're going to put you up in the stand and we're going to get the jury and we're going to look at all the evidence and all the evil in the world and all of the terrible things are happening and, and, and put you on the stand and say, why are you doing all of this? And treat you like we're your judge. And yet, I don't know what that accomplishes either. C.S. Lewis, one time he says, the ancient man approached God as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dock, an old English court term. The trial may even end in God's acquittal, but the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the dock. That today, what he's trying to say is we put God in the, on the stand. We put him on, the, 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 the tr on trial, literally and seek to accuse him. Why does an omnipotent God allow good people to have bad things happen to them? First question or first part of that, let's look at for just a moment is, why does an omnipotent God permit bad things to happen, period? You know, we read in the scripture that God is perfect, he's holy, he doesn't err, he, he's never surprised, he knows the punchline of every joke. You know, you think about that, he's already got it before you say it. And, and, and he's everywhere, he knows everything, and he exists outside of time, he knows the future, he, he knows the past, and, and don't you think that he could protect us from tragedy if he wanted to do that? If he wanted to, to really watch over us, couldn't he do that? And then we have to ask the question, is that even a reasonable question? Is, do we live in this this la-la land of, of blue skies and birds singing and rainbows all over? Or, or do we live in a world that really is dangerous and there's risks around us? What we, I think, sometimes say when we say, well, how could God allow this to happen is, I think we're saying we expect everything to go perfect. We expect everything to work out all the time. We expect things to be easy. If God was a loving God, then things shouldn't be so hard. We shouldn't have difficulties. And if he loves us, why doesn't he make our lives easier? Shouldn't he? Maybe not. You know, Jesus said that in the world we're going to have tribulations. But to take joy, he's overcome the world. That there are going to be problems. God has permitted us to live in a broken world, one that we've even damaged by our own sin when Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God and the effects of sin took over, that, that evil is real, and yet the question still comes out, why hasn't God stopped it? And that's where we don't have the answers. We don't have all of the inside information here, but we can say that we do live in that kind of world. We live in that world that is broken, and God gives us the right and the freedom to make choices, to make decisions of how we're going to respond to this world. We call it free will. We call it that ability for us to, to choose. That I choose you, you choose me, we choose friendship, we choose love. And we don't know everything, and God says that's okay. We don't understand everything, but in God's wisdom and in his righteousness we trust that he does the scripture says in isaiah 55 for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the lord as the heavens are higher than the earth so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts you know we do know some things about god we know that god's character is good and true uh, we know that he gave us freedom to choose to love him or reject him. We know that our freedom means that people do make bad choices and sin happens. We know that God allowed his only son to die on the cross to bring us back from the separation that sin caused. We know that despite forgiving us, sin still remains active in this world. We know that he uses trials to transform us to be more like him. Um, it's those difficult times 
that often bring the real person out, aren't they? When you cut through all the, the surface to get us down to who we are, that God uses to shape us. And therefore, he says, rejoice in your trials as they conform you to his image. And the scripture says he allows these things to come in to prove his love for us. What does it mean when difficulties come? Scripture says it means that he does care. It means that he's with us. That he's not willing to let us remain in our sin, but to see us through even the valley of the shadow of death to bring us through to the other side. A.W. Tozer was a, a great preacher of years ago and a writer. He wrote these words, and I've struggled with them, but he says it's really doubtful whether God can bless a person greatly until he has hurt him deeply. I struggle with that. And yet, where's the truth? It's, it's really doubtful that God can bless somebody greatly until he has hurt him deeply. You think of Jacob wrestling with God and, and the angel put in his hip out of socket and it was at that point where he quit wrestling with God, quit grasping onto his own selfishness but grasped onto God and God gave him a new future. Jesus says that, that when he's come, he, he brings forgiveness and and he brings new life. Paul says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. God loves us too much to let us remain where we were. He uses trials to mature us, to shape us, to mold us. And these trials hurt because they affect a change in us. The second part of that question is, why does God allow bad things to happen? And, and I guess the, the, the second part is to good people. And I think that's where people struggle as well. Why would God allow this to happen to a good person? And then we have to ask the question, are we really good? Um, are we really good? Because the Bible clearly says that we're not as it is written. There's no one righteous, not even one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I heard one pastor, a uh, minister, I was listening to the radio several weeks ago, saying, you know, the, the miracle is not that... Uh, God would save you or me. The, the miracle is that God would save anyone. That why would God save anyone as wicked as the human race is? Isaiah says our iniquities have separated us from our God. And he's hidden his face from us. Isaiah 64 says all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We're all shriveled up like a leaf. And like the wind our sins sweep us away. I think compared to Adolf Hitler, we're probably not too bad, you know. Compared to Osama bin Laden, we're probably pretty good. But compared to Jesus Christ, whew, we don't stand a chance. There is no possibility. Our best efforts are filthy rags. James says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And then we have to remember not only are we not good, but we have to remember that we have an enemy that rages in this world, Satan. 2 Corinthians 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. That he's at work in the world always seeking to destroy the things of God, always seeking to, to bring about death and and lying and, and thievery and, and anything that would destroy holiness. So what do we do? Knowing that we live in a broken world, knowing that we have an enemy that fights against us, knowing that, that difficulties happen and, and we are going to suffer, all of a sudden we understand why precisely God entered the world in Jesus Christ that we could find hope and find some way of rescue to, to be brought back into relationship with him. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11 says this, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. 
That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. He says there's a new world where sin will no longer reign. Coming for us that God will use what is going on here to bring us to there, to conform us to his image. And that's where that passage in Romans 8 comes about. And we know that in all things God works to the, for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And so you think about that because of his love for us, loving us too much to leave us the way we were, the way we are. That he grows us up in the trials and the tribulations of life. Just as Peter and James says, and they can become our joy because we know what they produce. We know the result that they can bring about to train us, to perfect us in our faith, to, to lead us through, to make us like his image. And so maybe what God would want us to do when we experience a trial and a difficulty, instead of going, the first thing out of our mouth is, why me, Lord? To say, thank you, Lord, for being with me. Thank you for seeing me through this. Thank you, Lord, for being my Savior. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come upon you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. So that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? He says that you become participants in his suffering so that you may receive his joy when his glory is revealed. You see, God does have our best interests in heart. And I think that's a hard thing to swallow, isn't it? It's a hard thing when we go through the trials and the difficulties and the doctor's report and the feeling bad and the feeling yucky and, and all of the difficult things. But God is with us. Rejoice always and again I say rejoice. And Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians that when we go through the trials of life and we have genuine joy that we are being transformed into his image with an ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So why? Why not? Because God is with us. Father, we just scratched the surface tonight. Probably raised more questions than we gave answers to. And yet we declare tonight that you are the answer. You are our hope. You are our God. And that we rejoice in all things when it comes to you and the perfecting of our faith and that by working out your will and your purpose to us we will bring honor and glory to you Lord in each of our lives no matter what the road would take us on or where the road would lead us or what difficulty might be around the corner we want to rest in you and trust in you we know that resting is not just sitting back and, and just wanting to enjoy the ride, though it's sure nice when we get to do that, but resting also is putting our full weight on you to carry us and to lead us through as we follow you and obedient to your will and to your purpose. So strengthen our heart that we may be faithful witnesses to you. Give us your words in those times that we don't know what to say. Show us your wisdom and those times that it's so far beyond our minds to even comprehend. Give us your presence when it just seems like we may be all alone. 
and put within us that deep abiding peace, that peace that passes all understanding, that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, even in the midst of fiery trials. Lord, I thank you for each person here tonight, and I pray your grace and your blessing upon them. Help us, Lord, to so live in this life that we can point others to your gracious kingdom in good times and in difficult times, in times of joy and in times of sorrow, in times of excitement, in times of suffering and pain. But to you be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray.